Hey everybody, I want to do another video about the score because um, people are still asking me like, why is the score special? Why is it different? What does it do that other heist games does, don't do? And I think that to me is really what's key about the heist. So we all know that in movies, particularly comedies and also suspense movies, there is a situation um, in film and TV, it also happens in comics, where two characters in a scene have different perceptions of reality right this is the key to farce it's the key to suspense we've seen a million sitcoms where character a is caught somewhere they shouldn't be and if they reveal their purpose or their intent it will give information to character b that they don't want character b to have and we know as an audience that character a is there for these nefarious purposes but we also know as an audience that character b has no reason to suspect and we get to see these these uh, versions of reality operating together. Same thing is when we know, for example, the character A doesn't want character B to open the door and character B keeps lunging for the door like they're going to open it. Um, character B, of course, doesn't know that there's a secret or something dangerous or a bucket of water about to hit them in the face. All this information that A has and we get this wonderful sense of, of these competing realities. That's the core of comedy. Um, of a lot of comedy, it's a core of farce, particularly. Um, and I think, uh, it also works. It's also the core of suspense, as Hitchcock said, you know, in Rope, there's a body in the middle of the room and it's, it's, we have these competing realities of these characters who know these two different things and we get it in lots of, um, some kinds of, of mystery suspense as well. And it can be a great core for role-playing games, um, where the characters are working with other characters that don't know things and they're trying to lie and trying to bluff. We've all had fun explanations where, um, we've made roles to bluff guards or something like that. And we we know more because we're being nefarious and we're sort of sneaking things past. But in fact, most role-playing games don't take an, a, what I call an authorial stance where we know that we're lying to each other and to the GM. Like We know that we're lying to the NPCs, um, but there's a lot of kept secrets in the standard version of role-playing games. Uh, one of the things I like about heavily narrative-based games like Smallville and um, Primetime Adventures is we skip all that. So in Primetime Adventures, uh, sorry, in, in, in both of those, there's no secrets that the table doesn't know. So you get to have these wonderful encounters where both players understand that player A is lying to player B, but character B doesn't know. And that actually makes things much more intense and much more uh, dramatic to watch. And it's great for the audience part of the gaming because you get that sense of oh my god, I can't believe player B doesn't know what player A knows as we have this encounter. And you can't have that happen in a fully Avatar-based game. If I need to not know the secret that player A is keeping for me to act out my character as player, player B, then I can't get that full sense of these double realities working. And as such... Uh, it's only in those kind of, I like to play those games where there is that sense of we're going to both play those characters so we get those full audience moments. And this comes into what I was, what I think about heist movies and mystery movies is that both of them um, are based strongly on reveals and recontextualizations. We see someone walk down a hallway and then they give an innocent re um, reasoning behind it. But then later, when we know who was the killer, we realize they were walking down the hallway to do something nefarious. And that scene that we saw as an audience suddenly changes in our mind. Instead of having two points of view at the same time, we have two points of view sequentially over time. We still recall that scene, but it's changed its meaning. Um, the best example of this, if you've seen any heist movies, you've probably seen Ocean's Eleven. And that has a very clear recontextualization moment in it. Um, so there's the character of Saul. He is set up in the movie as being old, weak, tired, and unreliable. They even ask him directly if he's up for it. During an early part of the heist, he is pretending to be uh, a, a German banker with a very important suitcase that must be stored in, in, the, in the special vault. Uh, he then is in a room and he starts to sweat. He seems uncomfortable and then he passes out. And as the audience, we suddenly think, oh no, Saul's had this moment that's been set up. Saul has had an injury. The plan has gone off the rails. 
But we find out a few minutes later that this is all part of the plan and that Saul is faking. This was a key part of the, of the, of the, of the movie. We then have this amazing moment of recontextualization as the same moment that we viewed has twisted around and it's changed its meaning. Nothing has changed about what the characters did. That's important. The characters haven't changed anything. Time hasn't been rewound. We haven't gone back and said, let's do that again. Time is, is moving forward, but our brain has to go back and recontextualize that. That's different to a flashback, which changes things. Um, although a flashback can be used for this kind of technique. Now, the key here is that most heist games use flashbacks actuated by the player. So you're walking along the street, you come to a wall that you didn't know was there because you, you, know, you didn't have all the details of the heist, and you go, okay, let's flash back to where I had six months in the mountains learning how to climb mount six months in the Alps, where I learned how to climb mountains like an expert, so I'm ready and I've got my kit here. Blades in the Dark has a, has a, a flashback mechanic. Instead of planning everything and doing a shadow run thing where you plan everything in advance and do shopping trips, just flash back to say you've got what you need. But this is all activated by the player. The GM presents a, a block and the player goes, well, obviously in the past, I have prepared for this. This causes no recontextualization of a scene. The scene hasn't happened yet. We've simply added but more background information. That means that when we thought we had nothing, we can then just go, no, no, I've got the thing right here. That is not recontextualization. That is simply a flashback adding preparation and making us think that a failure is in fact, allowing us to turn a failure into a success. What I wanted out of a heist role-playing game was the sense of recontextualization. And similarly, what I want out of a mystery is the same thing. Um, and that's what I did with partners. So what I wanted was the moment where without the players activating, Something we did in the past, like Saul fainting, that we thought was a failure, is reversed and turned into a success. And that is what the score does. It changes the understanding of previous events without an active in-story element of changing the chronology. We don't add anything in the past. We don't go back. We don't have the players activated. In fact, it's rather the cards that activate these situations. That's the real beauty here, which means we get the moment as an audience where things that we said our characters did turn out not to be as we interpreted them. And that is something that I can only see in very, very few role-playing games. It also happens in Relics. I mean, this is where I first got the idea. In Relics, you have a system where you hand over your backstory to other characters. And we had um, Peter building a character who he said, I was, I'm an honest cop. And then someone added a memory of him breaking the rules. And he was like, okay, so in that sense, I, I've conceived of myself as this honest cop, but now I'm realizing with this extra information that I'm not as honest as I claim to be and not as honest as I think I am. And that's a kind of thing that does happen in dramas and things like things like Lost, where we had these flashback mechanics to say, hey, this character who you thought might be the hero, we're going to add more information about him and we're going to reveal through flashbacks and backstory um, a different aspect of that character. So his actions and his deeds become recontextualized in your mind as you gain this more information they might be more of a villain, or they might be doing things for different reasons. They're doing things that we thought, we assumed were doing for a reason A are actually being done for reason B, because now we understand the, few, the extra picture. That moment of the audience suddenly knowing things, the things that the characters previously knew but the audience didn't, is very difficult to produce in role-playing games, unless you have some way of changing who controls the narrative. You cannot be surprised and you cannot recontextualize if you are constantly in control of your character. You have to give it away. And in Relics, we do that by adding flashbacks of memories of other people who knew you when and have different points of view about your character. Um, in, in Partners, we do it where the mystery is not actually solved until the end. So you get to get to the end of the story and then recontextualize the, the things that happened previously. And in the score, the way, the key way that we do it is that the acts, uh, as there are five acts in the game, and as you move through them, you move from success to failure and back again. But you don't, um, you always move back to success, which means previous failure scenes you get to reinterpret later on. You write them and you tell them as failure, but then when they switch back, you get to recontextualize those. 
and you don't know exactly when that change is coming, so you don't know which things that are actually failure that are going to become success. And that's the surprise. You know, we played games of, of, of the score where that happens all the time. We are halfway through, you know, we, we, we're having all sorts of failure, and then, you know, we ended up in the hospital, and that's when we realized we weren't actually heisting the bank at all. All the medical records were in the hospital. It was all the front. And we were surprised by that. Now, there's always these elements in, in role-playing games, and to an extent, I'm not innovating on that. This moment of, oh, I've got an idea that could have come, that can't have come from my brain on its own because the rules and the roles and the random tables and things that other people said and things that the GM said have brought us to a place that is complete and new and wouldn't exist on its own. That always does happen, and we do often find wonderful surprises where we go, oh, the story's really about this. But the score has that really built into its core where there is this element of surprise. Every time you play, you have these moments where you are sure you failed, and then you get to go, oh, wait, 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 hang on, that wasn't a failure, and here's why. And, and you get to be surprised over and over again, and sometimes in the biggest and most incredible ways. Most uh, Every time I played a heist RPG, there was no game I found that could separate that thing, that could cause a thing where the character who was being played knew more about the situation than the audience did, which is the player themselves. What I did when I set out to make the score was to make a role-playing game where the players, sorry, where the characters know more than the players and can surprise you because they're not actually doing what you think they're doing and you get this moment of recontextualization. As I say, I haven't seen any other games do that, not with a heist, not the way this does. Um, it's just always like, aha, but have you considered this? And that's not quite the same thing. It also turned out to be a game that you can play in 20 minutes or less with 18 cards. And it, it hopefully, I think, can really provide a different way into role-playing games that's got nothing to do with D&D &D and changes the way people think about RPGs. Uh, but that's all the, really a, uh, the cherry on top to what I was really trying for was that emotional recontextualization where suddenly a scene that has happened in the past is changed its meaning utterly without changing the nature of the scene and without taking an active step as the character and our brains having to go, oh, that thing that we said, we didn't mean it at all. We were lying and we didn't know we were lying. And that is the magic of the score.